Welcome to the Sailor Noob Podcast, where a super fan and a noob talk about the original Sailor Moon episode by episode. I'm your host, Mikan Hana, joined by my co-host... I'm the co-host, Caliban, the noob, and twins! <laughs> oh boy, I should have seen that one coming. <laughs> We're a couple of magical people ready to moon crystal power make up this episode. Sailor Noob is brought to you by Double Your Pleasure, Double Your Fun... Uh, I did a twin thing too. Yeah, so, all right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I guess we're guess we're even twinsies. What's the twenty first um, century internet version of the double mint jingle? It's like a TikTok where two people. Are... It's something that I don't know about because I'm not cool anymore. <laughs> one one person in red pants and one person in blue pants are both twerking. Yeah. Right. Uh, something and, like and that. And that's chewing gum. Does chewing gum need to sell to advertise? <laughs> Do you know the like... original double? I can't remember their names now because. Why would the I be twins. proud of that? But the yeah. original Doublement twins, uh, they had to stop because one of them got pregnant. Seriously? I mean, for, from her husband. <laughs> no, like, yeah. And so they couldn't do it anymore. And it's like, the shoot from the boobs up, I guess? Like, what? Oh, we have to look exactly the same. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yeah. Hey, why is one twin like holding a beach ball? Like, right? Like, just do that. So, anyway, but that led to many other twins over the years. And so. Oh, that's a fun thing. Yeah. Um, for the most part. And the twerking. <laughs> and the twerking. Uh, yeah, but today we are talking about episode number 81. Ankoku Gato Kansei, Nera Waleta Shogako in Japanese. The dark gate is completed, the targeted elementary school, the English translation, and the English title, Child's Play. The, t- the targeted elementary school. Yeah. That's, uh, let's see. Is a targeted elementary school good? Uh, if it's uh, government assistance, yes. Oh my goodness! If it's goodness. A, a terrorist attack, no. Yeah. If if it has a dark henge on top of it, <laughs> absolutely freaking not. What if the dark henge becomes three times as tall as the building? Yeah. Right. Does that fit into the? This is, these are good buildings. I guess yeah. they're you know earthquake proof. Right. Exactly. Japan, um, so. You have to you have to think ahead about any is this possible a, a natural load disaster. Bearing roof? <laughs> yeah. Right. Why are these um, these particular uh, Esmerad uh, Dark Henge statues are gold? They've always been green before. Because they're not playing around. Is it because we're we're completing it? Not playing around anymore. We're not we're not playing around Game, and we're completing are over. it. We'll yeah. talk about that in a bit. First, I want to talk about the surge of listeners that we have gotten recently Whoa. from the country of Germany. Ah, I just I was checking out Guten our tag. stats. It's not well. I guess I don't know. I yeah. this is I I I am German and I don't know it's, much. I German, guess it's so. it's Guten Tag as as we're recording this, but <laughs> maybe it's uh, Guten Abend where you're listening to it. But uh, I was checking out our stats because we switched our uh, stat providers or counters or whatever you call them. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I just noticed that like a large percentage of listeners uh, are coming from Germany. That's really cool. Yeah. So willkommen to our German listeners. Oh. Uh-huh. Very nice. Sailor Moon is, of course, popular worldwide, but yeah. was certainly popular in the mid '90s in Germany when it was playing on ZDF, which is their uh, public broadcasting option. Okay. It was called Das Mädchen mit den Zaubenkraften, Z- uh, the Girl of Magic Powers. I like it. I, I think it's a uh, it's a snappy title. Yes. Yeah. Bunny and her friends were, <laughs> as far as I know, like most of the. Names, I think, and everything uh-huh. was, um, you know, Re- not translated. It was oh. all uh, just localized, but uh, they did call Usagi Bunny. I mean, she's called Bunny in the first English translation um, of the manga. Her, ne- her name is Bunny in that, too. So um, I get it, and that's what her name means. So um, I don't think it's it's that bad. So that's great. People all over the world, of course, love Sailor Moon, and we just want to say danke to our to our German listeners. Uh, we also want to say danke to our new patron. Yes. We have a new patron at the Inner Senshi level. Uh, and, you know, apologies, you know, this person signed up right before we went on break. So they uh-huh. deserved this thanks for a while. But Ox has joined the show at the Inner Senshi level. 
Welcome, Ox, and thank you. Yeah, and I uh, hope you enjoy our Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon recaps. Yes. Where we talk about the fashion, food, and culture of the 2000s. So, so aughts. <laughs> Just so, it's so naughties. So, so, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> As the kids uh, say. The naughties. Yeah. Um just, it's coming. You, you laugh, but the uh, the two thousands nostalgia is beginning to be strong. Well, it's about twenty years ago now, so which is hard to believe. This, like, middle period, Britney Spears. Uh huh. Um, the apotheosis of the boy band era. Uh, emo was huge. Really, like that's when in and sync was going from strength to strength. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Emo. Yep. Um. Uh, uh fashion. <laughs> Question mark? It's I don't weird. know, man. It's, it's weird to be a nostalgic for something that you, you know, essentially just didn't know was happening when it was there, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. But I, I don't know. I could see it. You know, and this in the is '90s, youth. we were like, "Oh, bell bottom, so crazy." And I'm sure, like, you know, my parents are like, "Yeah, they're called pants." Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I, I know. So I know. it's our turn. Yeah, right. Exactly. But anyway, um, <laughs> there'll be some talk like that, but I promise not too much. In our Patreon offerings, uh, we, of course, have outtakes from the show yes. and our reviews of anime and of Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon. So if you want that, check us out at patreon.com forward slash Sailor Noob. All right. Without further ado, would you like to give us a breakdown of today's episode? Do you always say without further ado? I say it a lot. Oh, I guess I should have been not furthering ado, <laughs> but <laughs> I will try not to in this recap. A recap that I'm going to say is plotty. Yeah. There's there's some plot. We're moving things forward. Uh-huh. We're moving the story forward. Yes. But there's some character stuff too. We open in school, in Chibiusa's new school. She's being introduced to her new classmates as Miss Usagi Sakino, the transfer student. Mm-hmm. And right away, some dicky kid is like, Oh, wow, you're so tiny. I guess you're Chibiusa. Yeah. Which I means not wrong. But uh, <laughs> another kid, a girl, comes to Chibi's defense, saying to the kid, Why do you always come up with these things? They had a kid with a back brace the week before, I, I guess. I have no He's, idea. This guy has a history, I guess, of uh, picking on little little girls. Uh, anyway, uh, she whacks the kid over the head with a rolled up coloring book, let's say. Sure. It could have been a Vogue. I don't know. <laughs> and the kid changes his tune and he says, how about Chibi Yusa Chan? Uh-huh. So she's okay with that. Yeah. It's... That, as long as it's respectful. Right, exactly. How about Buttface Chan? Yeah. <laughs> And I, you know, just noticed that this girl, we'll probably talk about this in the fashion segment, but mm-hmm. she's got a um, a different kind of look. She's got uh, what looks to be like a, a traditional, a chunk sum mm-hmm. uh, dress or, or, or blouse. Yeah, or chi pao, I think is another name for it. Yeah. Yes, chi pao. Uh-huh. Uh, and she's got the um, the oxhorn uh, braid thing, the chun li thing. Yes, yeah. exactly. The, the bun, yep. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. We transition from this scene, which uh, is presented with a very dreamlike quality, to chibi in bed dreaming. Yeah. With a little kitty paw holding a, a cloth to her forehead. Uh-huh. It seems that Chibi is sick. There's a there's a bug going around and the cats are taking care of her. I would want a nursemaid with opposable thumbs, but <laughs> they are magical cats. So they are. Maybe they contribute something more. Chibi wakes up and she's feeling she's feeling better. She wonders if she can go back to school tomorrow. Luna's like, "Oh, you sure? Is school fun?" And Chibi says, "Yeah. There's this kid here. It's, it sits next to me." And uh, but before she can finish, Usagi busts in and says, "Hey, what's up? Feeling better? Everyone's here to visit you." <laughs> and yes, all the girls are here. Ami has brought Chibi some. Dunkin' Donuts or something. We don't know. Yeah. It's a little box. And that's not all. Her friend is here, too. Uh-huh. Her name, we learn, is Momo. Uh-huh. Because Chibi screams it over and over as she dashes out of bed to meet her, knocking the cats aside. The two are having a real, real giggle fest, having a good time, overjoyed to see each other. Momo says that school is lonely without Chibi, and Chibi says, I'll be back tomorrow. And the girls, our girls, are watching this whole little uh, tete-a-tete. Yes. And they're happy that she's happy. Mm -hmm. Makoto says, she must have been lonely coming from the future by herself. And Ami gets thoughtful, and she thinks, why is the enemy after Chibiusa anyway? And all the other girls stop short at this. They seem a little embarrassed that they don't know. And frankly, haven't thought much about it. I'm a little embarrassed for them. Remember that time we went into her brain? What was going on there? Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts. Kids. That night in Juban Park, a dark henge appears, as does a mysterious figure. Mm-hmm. Now check this out. 
bunch of rock comes out of the ground, mm-hmm. forms into like a pillar of rock. Yes. Then the rock turns to crystal. Uh-huh. Then the earth cooled. Then the dinosaurs came. <laughs> <laughs> then the crystal turns into a man. A yeah. man with lavender hair. A crystal man. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> he's got the uh, dark crystal earrings that signifies being in the Black Moon Clan. He does. And a loose-fitting tank top with mint-colored slacks. Mm-hmm. Has he been raiding Memorial's closet? Possibly. Possibly. He has an inverted black moon on his forehead and a jewel around his neck. Mm-hmm. His skin is purplish and his eyes flash red as he goes, <laughs> And the dark henge crackles with power. Uh-huh. And as waves of the dark power wash over the foliage in the park, we see the trees and brush decay and wither. Wait a minute. They've been able to take plant energy this whole time? We have to never go seen vegan? that. Yeah. <laughs> you know how much how much more flora biomass there is on Earth than fauna? It's like four to one. Uh-huh. There's like four times as many. Um, a lot of it's bacteria, but like floral organisms and there are sure. fauna organisms. Yeah. If the Black Moon Clan goes vegan, this is already over. They win. <laughs> I guess they haven't thought about that. Demando's still like sipping on his wine. And, and this <laughs> and this guy's got it, – it, it seems like they're, they're slacks. I, said, I guess I said slacks, but like yoga pants hadn't been invented. No. So if you went to the gym or to the yoga class, mm-hmm. you wore like – these sort of loose fitting, yeah. you know, warm up pant type things. Sure. So this guy's got a real patchouli vibe around him. He does. I'm gonna he, I'm gonna call him the yoga bastard. Okay. <laughs> or uh, yogi hair. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Hey, boo boo. <laughs> well, we zoom out of there literally. We like zoom into the sky to like uh, seeing Tokyo like a map, and then we zoom back in at Juban Elementary School. Yes. Where a similar epicenter of dark energy is pulsing. It's mm-hmm. a cool shot for a 90s cartoon. It is. No Google Maps back then. No. But it gives you that feel. And there on the roof of the school is a similar looking person, also with lavender hair and earring, except this one has very pale skin, uh-huh. like an albino Pilates instructor. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he looks like one of the Wonder Twins from when the Justice League episode, the cartoon where they did uh, this, this pastiche of the Super Friends. They had the guy who was like the tornado guy, and then they had the, like, the Wonder Twins. I, I don't remember it super well, but I'll take <laughs> the your ultimate. The ultimate, they were called. Okay, okay. So I guess he's Zan, right? Okay, sure. Form of bucket of smart water. <laughs> Great. Esmeralda <laughs> approaches our Zan and says, everything is going smoothly. Chiral? Uh-huh. So this is, Chiral is his name? Right, 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 right. Uh, in mathematics uh, or in um, chemistry, mm-hmm. organic chemistry, Chirality is is the property of something that is not identical to its mirror image. Right. Um, the reason that it's called chir- – chiral is, is like the Greek word for hand, and it's supposed to be because your hand is not like the mirror image of your hand, which uh-huh. is like put your hand up against a mirror. Does it look like – does your right hand look like your left hand? Yeah, I – What kind of idiot came up with that? Actually, I, Lord Kelvin came up with that. Uh-huh. But it's just like – in in chemistry, it means a molecule that like is not – you know, it, it's it's – uh, different than its mirror image. Right. So if you had another molecule that was a mirror image of it, it they, would they wouldn't have different. the same, yeah, but they wouldn't have the same properties. They would interact right. differently. Okay, right. So I just think like, oh, it was my hand and then like my other hand. It's like, don't put your hands together. Don't they kind of look the same? I don't, <laughs> I don't understand that unless, and, and this might be completely off the deep end, but like, what if you like put your hands spread out in front of a mirror and you're like, oh, Oh, my right hand looks different than my left hand because my thumb's over here on this hand and but it's, it's over. Right. But you can tell that like uh, poets and writers are different than like scientists because Generally a scientist speaking, is yeah. like, oh, the mirror image. It's like, but a mirror image literally means, I know that it's like, oh, like I raise my left hand, they raise their right hand. But you, right. you invoked a mirror and in a mirror, or if I put my hands together. I know. Humans uh, humans, and some other creatures have a bilateral symmetry. Right. Which means that our left side looks like our right side. Right. Now, not all animals are like that. Definitely plants aren't like that. There are some animals with a radial symmetry, mm-hmm. like a sea anemone. Sure. Um, but yeah, the whole point is that our left side looks like our right side if everything's going well. Right. So it's a weird thing to then take that term and go, yeah, that means that they don't look alike. I know. It's obviously I've 
this has bugged me since college. When, it's, it's, when it I'm is studying a, science, but it is a weird thing to wrap your head around. So anyway, uh, she asks him, "How is a chiral doing?" A chiral is the opposite of chiral mm-hmm. in the science world, but also in the world of Sailor Moon. Yes, he says pretty good. This is what I've been waiting for. This is it. Yeah, Esme. With two dudes. Uh-huh. Esme should have had a pair of Rip Yoga dudes as her hench boys since day one. She yeah. is 100% that bitch. She is. I she, agree. She says, no more screwing around. Mm-hmm. I got orange henges now. We're not going to be poisoning cakes or whatever. We're going <laughs> to just get these big henges. We get all the energy. We're done. We go home. Yes. She says, you two, get rid of those pesky girls. And they disappear to do just that. Yes. The next day, Chibi is running to school. She's late. She got up late. Uh-huh. Luna and Luna P are running or floating, I guess, with her. She gets to school and she hears some kind of ruckus in the schoolyard. She goes to see what it is. And what it is, is a full-on rumble. Yeah. You got kids kicking the crap out of other kids. They're pulling hairs, rolling around on the ground. Mm-hmm. Looks like Braveheart in short pants. <laughs> Chibi's like, everybody's playing, but class has already started. And Luna's like, you... You think this is playing? I am very disturbed. What are schools like in the future? I know. Like, Chibiusa, <laughs> this should not be a normal. This is weird. No child left without a black eye. <laughs> uh, just put a pin in that for now. Uh, they're, fight- they're fighting. Mm-hmm. Chibi sees that a huge kid, let's call him Trevor, has <laughs> Momo-chan cornered against the wall of the school. And this kid, he is drawn huge. Yeah. He's essentially like adult proportions. Uh-huh. You know, but he has a, a huge kid head still. He looks like, uh, you know, if like Modoc was on the basketball team. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And he says to her, you're too uppity. And she says, shut up. You're pissing me off. And yeah. she goes uppity the side of his head uh-huh. with an axe kick. Yes. Sending him crashing to the ground. And he hits hard like car alarms are going off. <laughs> Chibi is like stunned at this display of prowess. But Momo is like, you want to fight too? <laughs> and her eyes grow red. Don't be so familiar with me. Because I hate you. Yeah, what? Chibi's like, what What is this? I know. Wrong question, Cheebs, because it's sweep the leg, Johnny. (laughs) And Chibi goes down. Momo runs off laughing. And Luna wonders, like, what the hell is going on? Yeah, seriously. No more monster energy drink. I know. for, For morning snack. She gets her answer as a blast of energy radiates out from the rooftop of the school. Mm-hmm. But Artemis says, it's the light of dark power. And Luna says, what did you get here? I was so happy that she, that was her reaction she's, because I was thinking the same dang thing. She's so spooked her moon flies off of her head. And like spins I didn't notice that. Yeah. That's great. I love it. We see, there's, a, there's a couple, there's a lot of Looney Tunes stuff in this. There's we'll some like jump bit. scares and spooky stuff. We see inside the school and it is trashed. A million students with a million cloths couldn't put this back together again. No. And the windows are broken. There's crap all over the walls. On the blackboard, somebody's drawn what looks like an angry face and an explosion. Yeah. <laughs> and I Chibi know. looks forlornly at her ruined classroom, but no time for tears because Chibi is immediately attacked by Momo mm-hmm. at the head of a group of students and their teacher. So yeah. this is not kid related. Mm-hmm. This is not the, the fire of youth. We are young. This yeah. is not hormones. The teacher is involved. The teacher is wielding a T-square like an axe. Yeah. Momo charges at Chibi with a broom handle and Chibi dodges frantically. Mm-hmm. They chase her through the halls of the school and we pan up to the roof to see Chiral observing it all menacingly. Chibi ducks into a classroom to avoid the mob. She runs into Artie and Luna. I guess it's a science classroom. Because they're hiding behind an anatomical dummy. Yeah. And as they come out, it moves a little bit and it scares Chibi. Uh Uh-huh. That's a good bet. Yeah. Just wait. Before she can catch up with the cats, the silhouette of Momo appears in the window. And she throws back the door looking for Chibi. No one is there. Momo leaves and Chibi and the cats come out of hiding. Artie is sure that it's another plot by Esme. Luna tells him to get the sailor soldiers and tells Chibi that they're leaving. Mm -hmm. Chibi refuses, saying she's scared, but she won't abandon Momo. Yeah. Luna says, okay, all right, we'll stay until Usagi and the others arrive. At Juban Jr., Artie has told Ami, Usagi, and Mako the situation, and Ami gets a wrist call from Minako saying there's an incident at Juban Park. Yes. They're like, oh, don't split the party, what do we do? Yeah. They decide that Ami and Mako will go to the park, and Usagi will save Chibi. Mm-hmm. All three girls transform our first pre-eye catch transformation in a while. Yes. This is early. We cut right to the other side of that wrist call where sailors Mars and Venus are staring at the now huge henge in the park. Mm-hmm. Venus senses that the enemy's tactics are different this time. And this is a desperate attempt to complete their mission. Just then, a chiral appears and laughs at their dismay. Mm-hmm. What a jerk. <laughs> 
Back at Juban Elementary, Usagi and Artemis arrive just in time to see a desk come sailing through a window. Yeah. And they both see that the hinge on the roof is now gigantic. Mm -hmm. In the park, Venus and Mars are squaring off against a Chiral who evades their powers, as well as a shine aqua illusion from Mercury, Mm -hmm. who has just arrived with Jupiter. Mm -hmm. A Chiral in his mint-colored slacks says, This confrontation will end at Juban Elementary. Bring your A-game and I'll see you there. Mm -hmm. And he vanishes laughing. Inside the elementary school, Usagi and Artemis are sneaking around looking for Chibi. Usagi says, Chibi, it's Sailor Moon. And here's where we get the real science class bit. Yeah. Because a skeleton across the room says, Sailor Moon. (laughs) And it (laughs) falls towards Usagi, lands in her arms. She's like, whoa, way too spoopy. No. no. (laughs) But of course, Chibi's behind it. And Usagi thinks, oh, but here's the real scare. Because Chiral appears right there and I... lashes out at Usagi. And she dashes out of the room with Chibi. couple of moments of genius here. First, before he appears, uh, some dust or gravel kind of drops down. Uh-huh. Because he and a Chiral have, like, like stone... Earth or... Earth Earthmancy or whatever. Yeah. yeah. They can move through, like, materials. Mm-hmm. So presumably he's come down through the ceiling. Probably. Yeah. Yep. Like, Good you know, point. if this was a horror movie, that she would be holding Chibi and then behind her, you know, down yes. the But they kind of already did that with Only Wampa Donna. They didn't want to repeat that. <laughs> and then second, in true Looney Tunes fashion, Usagi runs away so fast, her Odango stay behind for a second. And oh, then they, no! psh, they kind of snap after her. I didn't notice yeah. that. That's great. The only thing they're missing is a, you know, like the Fred Flintstone feet sound. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's hard to do with your own. <laughs> and, and like his That's feet the best just I can look, do. look like a, a, they're, they're pedaling or whatever. Yeah. yeah. In the hall, Chiral comes through the wall and confronts Usagi. She says, how can you do this to a school? In the name of the moon. But he interrupts her. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. I know. He interrupts her to say, you got time to say all that. Why not pray to Buddha? Uh-huh. And a Chiral appears out of him. They split. Mm-hmm. They both surround Chibi and Usagi and slash at them with their long fingernails. Chibi notices another new arrival, Momo with her broom. I know. Oh, no. The real problem's here. <laughs> the real monster. Chibi's like, Momo. But Artie says, no, she's corrupted by dark power. She won't listen. Chibi impetuously charges at Chiral, but before she reaches him, Shabon Spray fills the hall with mist. Mm-hmm. The four sailor soldiers have arrived, and Jupiter says, we came like you asked. <laughs> <laughs> Chiral says, catch me if you can, and he disappears. A Chiral is still there, and the girls tell him to give it up, but he says, foolish girls, and Momo charges them with her broom. Mm-hmm. Chibi tries to run to her, but Ray quickly pulls her back before the broom Almost splits her skull. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> Mom, Momo's got mad staff skills. Uh-huh. And she thrusts her staff into the group of girls. Jupiter turns too late to avoid a blast from the reappeared Chiral, and she is electrocuted. Yeah. A Chiral forms a dark barrier around the girls, and now every, everybody's electrocuted. Yep, yep. Everybody, even Momo and Chibi. And they're all just writhing and fighting pain. Chibi runs to Momo and grabs her, and as she does... Her own brand of energy begins to stream out of her, Mm -hmm. dispelling the droid's powers. The energy fades, and Momo comes back to her senses, wondering what's happened. A. Chiral takes this moment to throw a blast of dark lightning at Chibi, but Momo pushes her out of the way Mm -hmm. and takes the blast full on. She collapses to the ground to Chibi's horror, and Chibi experiences a flashback to the Black Moon Clan attack on Crystal Tokyo. Mm Mm-hmm. She screams in pain and fear, and a blinding blast of light explodes out of her. She goes full Gohan. She totally does. The moon on her forehead glows intensely. She says, how dare you do that to Momo and my mom? Ah!" Yeah. And she just blows the droids away, like (laughs) throws them out of the building. I know. In the future, we see a dark mass of crystals that begin to glow intensely. Mm -hmm. And we see both Creepy Wise Guy Mm -hmm. and Prince Demando go, huh? Nani? Yeah, right. The Sailor Scouts are terrified at what's happening, but Chibi's light starts to fade, and she collapses. Chibi is still reaching for Momo, and something switches on in Usagi. She says, Mercury, Venus, take care of Chibi Yusa. We'll take care of those two. Mm -hmm. Back in the future, Wise Guy and Demando are looking at the crystals that I mentioned before. I don't know if I've seen these. They look like a big flower or a tree, maybe? Yeah, I think... 
It's 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 unclear, but it kind of seems like it's somehow it was caused by Chibiusa somehow. Mm. I I don't know, and and it's unclear to me if it's in in the future with them or if they see it in the past. Mm, that'd be weird. You you think? I don't know why that would be, but it could be. I, I don't, don't know. know. I'm a noob. <laughs> but at this, wise guy said. It'd be a waste of power to kill the rabbit. Mm-hmm. We should have that power for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And behind a pillar, Saphir is just creeping. He does not approve. Right. That's what I'm taking from Interesting. that. Back in the past, Sailor Moon challenges the droids to come out. And they do. Mm-hmm. Out of the ground. Right behind the girls. Yeah. You saw them do that before. But yeah. anyway, they're caught off guard. But before the droids can strike, a red rose sinks itself into the concrete of the schoolyard. Mm-hmm. Tuxedo Mask has arrived. They get me every time with these. I know what's going to happen. I know. And and they keep, you know, variating like the sequence of events and and you you think Which is great. I mean, he's not mentioned the whole show and you think, "Oh, maybe he's not going to be on this one." And then you get the girls oh, dun, 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 yeah. and they're going to oh, let's get him. Yes. And it's like, "Oh no." And then Yes. Tuxedo Mask is here. <laughs> In this case, he's up on top of the spherical jungle gym. <laughs> I love this entrance and he's timed his, so much. He's timed his throw, or maybe, I don't know, it just worked out okay, so that it's spinning and he spins to face them as he speaks. Oh, my God. He says, turning a school into a battlefield is an outrage. Sailor Moon, teach them the ABCs of justice. Yeah. Sailor wow. Moon begins a Moon Princess Halation, but the droids begin to sink into the ground to protect themselves. And that mm-hmm. is when Sailor Jupiter does a sparkling wide pressure and literally plows a line through the concrete and yep. earth into them. I love it. Electrocuting the droids and leaving them vulnerable. There's your ray game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how you use your powers, you know, and you 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 think about what can I do in this fight, and you know? She doesn't do anything up to that point. No. She even gets like kind of like bitch slapped by one of them. Yeah. And they're just saving it for like I wish that she'd just blown him up completely. Like, I'll handle this one, Sailor Moon, don't worry about it. I kinda wish but that she contributes. They would... <laughs> I, I know, and I do I, I get that. I wish that the Senshi kind of like finished the bad guys more often. Um it but it you know, more often than not it is Sailor Moon, but well, Moon finishes the MPH, the droids are no more. Both hinges explode and the threat is passed. Mm-hmm. Esmerod appears, furious. She's yeah. so mad that she snaps her fan in two. I know. You know she's pissed. Although it looks like one of those like cheap fans you can just get at a, at a store, a curio store. Really? You think Esme would be caught dead Oh, you think it's ivory? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> she says, I'll kill you myself. And she rears back to blast them, but she gets a brain call from the future. <laughs> yeah. Will you accept the charges? Yeah. Demando says, wait, our objectives have changed. Come back to the future. Mm -hmm. Esme tells the girls, don't be smug. You haven't won. We'll meet again. And she disappears laughing. We cut to a hospital where Momo is being cared for. She seems in good spirits Mm -hmm. and it's implied she'll be okay. Yeah. Later, Chibi looks at the setting sun from the roof of... Either her school or maybe the hospital. I'm not sure. Yeah, some building. (laughs) And she tells her assembled friends... I'm going to the future to save my mom. Please, everyone, come with me. Yeah. Mamoru tells her, let's all go together. Yeah. And the girls are like, well, thanks for speaking for us. Yeah, I guess we'll go. We'll do it too. Uh Uh-huh. Because this won't end until we go to the future. Yes. And Usagi says, we're doing it for Chibi Usa. Uh Uh-huh. And Chibi thinks, mom, I'll save you no matter what. Yes. Yeah, fight fight music. We're super serious. Yeah. Uh, This is happening. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like, I can't even keep track now, and I just assume the show has gotten it right. Okay. But it seems like maybe a little while ago we were like, all right, everyone, let's wrap it up. Uh, (laughs) Let's move on. Yeah. And this is like, this episode is definitively, they're like, okay, we're done. Yeah. Forget the dark hinges. I know. It's over. We're just going to move on to the next thing. Yeah. Does that mean that it didn't succeed? We had fun. We had some fun along the way. Esme was great. And it was also, more, we've talked about this before, it was less, um, let's get into the lives of these, these droids. You mm-hmm. know, it was more like, let's have another segment where um, a new bad guy gets to do something. Yeah. And, but instead of having four characters who will become sympathetic and we are kind of exploring them as they're antagonizing the Sailor Soldiers. Right. We will instead have a series of character episodes. That will now dig back into the sailors themselves. Yes. And develop them a little more. And then the the meta plot or the the ongoing thing becomes a little less important. Yeah. I, I think 
And yes. so I'm a little more appreciative of the fact that I was kind of focusing, you know, I've talked about it being plotty. I was folk, I was expecting it to be more plotty when mm-hmm. it didn't really matter. Like we had, you know, an episode for pretty much every sailor to get their little, where are we at now? Yeah. For for the most part, although I think you mentioned on a previous... And they don't take out, you know, it's not a Rubea situation. They don't take Esme out. We're going to see her again. Mm-hmm. She was just there to sort of facilitate the girls developing their characters more. And right. now we're going to move to a new location. Right. But I think you, you mentioned in a previous episode, it's been a while since we've seen, got a, a Mako episode. I think the last time was... Um, they got to a- come up with some new boyfriend or yeah, well, <laughs> twist or something. Uh, or some other sport she's good at. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or other activity, fill in the blank. You guys know about uh, this field hockey? Yeah, right. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, the last one was like with Alan on when she gave the blood transfusion to, to her friend. To- to friend zone, friend zone, John. Friend zone, John. Yeah. Uh, so it has been a while, but yeah, there there is some great character episodes in this. I I, don't, I really enjoy the Black Moon Clan as far as bad guys go. Um, overall, um, you know, and I think their their game is strong, or at least I enjoy watching them. Um, <sighs> And you, you you have a deep sigh there. I'll need all the information before I make my decision. Okay, well that's fine. Because I assume more is coming as to why they're doing this, mm-hmm. their motivations. Yeah, we don't really, we still don't really they know. Are just I guess kind of generally saying. bad. Yeah, and so like, why I are want... they after Chibiusa so much? Yeah, but yeah. Um, that's coming. Yeah, that's coming. I mean, we they have said that the silver Imperium crystal they need to destroy it because, or the silver crystal they need to destroy it because otherwise the black crystal won't be as powerful. Do you mean the evil black crystal? Yes, the evil black crystal. Right. Yeah. Get it right. Okay. Sorry. Um. So Chibiusa seems like she gets sick a lot, but maybe that's just because she's uh, this a is, kid. Yeah. And then also we had Minako a being a nurse. Of, yeah. And, this is. I feel like this is. She wasn't sick then. Yeah. Then maybe it just caught up to her. But she was sick when they went into her head. <laughs> well, that, that was dream she was, episode. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. That was like a heart sickness, though. Yeah. I mean, that was like I a know. malaise. Yeah. I don't think it was like a. Like she had a pathogen. Cold. Yeah, I suppose you're right. I don't know, maybe her emotions are connected to her health. Like a like a Tolkien elf. Oh boy, she can have the sick, the sadness unto death. Yeah, I I don't know. I feel like they also did, something else they haven't really made clear is like she's tried so many times to go back to the future, and she was told by Poochan, who we later found out was Pluto, um, that she she couldn't come back yet. But we didn't really get a good reason as to why. And like You've now, got, now we got she has eight episodes we're contracted for. I know, but she now she has powers that she didn't know she had, and nobody else knew she had. And now she's like, uh, "I got this," and and now it's gonna work. So, like, why is it like you know why is it different? And I think that the manga did. I won't get into it, but I think that the manga did a better God. job of setting up those parameters. And of course, it's it's shorter and everything too. I did want to mention. That, you know, so the Black Moon Clan, they, in the, in the manga, they, they all have kind of like basically one confrontation with the, the senshi and then they're gone. Um, and that's just because it's shorter. And when Esme fights them, um, she has, uh, Chiral and Achiral are in the manga. They are there. So, um, I just think that that is interesting, but you were picking up on like, this is who she is. This is who she should have been. All along, it would have been different if she had these two henchmen with her and maybe a, a weekly droid as well. I don't know. Maybe it's too, too, uh, too many characters. Queen Barrel. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, I, um, I don't have a problem with it. I, I, you know, I think it's, there's a, there's a, well, there's a longstanding just storytelling, you know, convention, but mm-hmm. definitely an anime one of a character having powers or abilities. <clears throat> needing to um, to master them or simply grow into them. And, you know, Chibi's very early in her life's journey I here. Know. So, you know, it it's interesting that they her powers have sort of manifested or expressed themselves previously through um, her being uh, emotionally distraught, you know. Afraid. Sort of in danger, afraid. Yeah. And this is more... You know, just she's just angry, basically. <laughs> like she's just mad. She's just indignant. She's I mean, it really mad. is like I always thought it was kind of weird that it's like, 
oh yeah, you know, the anger of a scion is is their true power. When you make a scion mad, oh boy. And um, I, I, I never knew how I felt about that. But then I think about like, you know, Gohan, mm-hmm. it, people have to be familiar with Dragon Ball. If they're not, maybe we'll just cut this out. But like Gohan finally going Super Saiyan and, you know, um, coming into his, the control of his power mm-hmm. and defeating Cell. It, it's about anger because he also, like Goku, sees his friend die in front of him. And, yeah. But it's more about like, I, I can never forgive you. It's more about yeah. you've finally gone too far. I, now I need to do this to to take the power to destroy you to protect everyone else. I think that is the, the exact same. How do we note translate that? Anger to Chibi. Get set. angry, Gohan. I know. <laughs> well, but like I, I'll the I'll never forgive you, and not just for my friend, but for my mother, and and then also the the protection thing. Like I, she was trying to protect Momo as much as she could. Yeah. So now that she has that conviction, and she isn't just. Um, a little girl whose you know, entire life was stolen from her in a yeah. vicious attack. Like now she has the presence of mind and the control over her powers to use the key to go home. She's she's brave enough to, it's, to it's, face it. It's bravery, but uh-huh. she's never had a problem with bravery. No, she hasn't. Uh, Two dollars. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's understanding. Yeah. I think it's, it's understanding the importance of of this quest that she's going to take on. Yeah, I have to I have to fight these people uh, because the, of what they did to my mother. The daughter becomes the mother. Yeah. The mother becomes the daughter. Oh my god. What's well, not? That'll be $50,000, please. <laughs> Marlon I I work on Marlon Brando rates. I know. I mean, do you get the feeling too that like for some reason like Momo really has it in for Chibiusa? Like she is like actively looking for her to like attack her. Well, I thought we would wait for this later, but maybe okay. this is just now. Yeah. Um, the whole point, I think, what, and I have read the manga, but look, the whole wow. thing that uh, Naoko might have been going for mm-hmm. uh, when she took that organic chemistry class at Tokyo University was... Oh, it's more than a class. We'll get to that later. Oh, okay. We are going to do it. Mm-hmm. Is that, um, you know, if we're talking about the taking the concept, the scientific concept of chirality and then putting it in floofy artistic <laughs> terms. Sure. Uh, I myself... And that I am made of two people, aren't I? The artist and mm-hmm. the scientist. Sure, yeah. Who is there? Yeah. Who's the Marvel character that's like that? Oh, uh, n- nobody, because he probably slept in and never went to the science class to get bit by the spider. And there's get the, plenty get the powers. of scientists, but they don't consider themselves artists. Exactly. Yeah. They can't handle that kind of duality. The no. point is, is that we're seeing that reflected in this. We never find out what the rage virus is that makes everybody go crazy, but mm. I just assume that they become their complete opposite. So Momo... A, um, I was going to say gentle, but <laughs> too hard to introduce to her assaulting somebody. But somebody who is um, kind, you know, right. and is a defender becomes, you know, a savage aggressor. Okay. All right. That makes sense to me. And that's the only person we focus on. We don't know if the teacher is. Yeah. Uh, didn't give any homework. Now she's giving everybody homework. Like We don't know what her opposite is, but we do know what Momo's is. Yeah. Right. Do you think that maybe a part of that, too, is, like, their feelings become the opposite of their feelings? Like, because she feels, like, this strong connection with Chibiusa and she really cares about you her now. You don't know me. Now she, like, hates her and can't stand her. Yeah. Yeah. I think that goes with what I said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. All right. Good. We're in, we're in agreement. All now. done. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> So Caliban, you finally show your face, just in time for me to blow it off. It's fitting you chose to hide in this abandoned movie theater, Mika and Hana, because for you, the show's over. Big talk, but soon you'll be as dead as all the well-loved celebrities we lost this year. When I'm done, they'll be cleaning you off the walls like COVID-19. Wait, where's your face mask? I I thought we were going to find outside. Oh, come on! I mean, if if the murder hornets aren't out there still. Take this. If you want to watch HBO Max on my phone? I'll start cooking some beans in this old boot. Just Enough Trope. News, reviews, and apocalyptic views every Monday on the Just Enough Trope Network. Won't the 5G kill us? Shh. 
for Kuro Kuro Miru or Curiously Looking Around, we talk about elements of Japanese culture within the episode. Today, I thought we would talk about history of China-Japan relations. Huh. So the relations between the two countries. Okay. Yes. Uh, and I'll get into why. So in this episode, we are introduced to Chibiusa's friend, whose full name is Momoko Momohara, a.k.a. Momo-chan. You guys worked real hard on that name. Um, what Momohara? What's she's... I, I don't know. Peach person, peach lady. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. So when you add ko to the end of something, it's kind of, for female names at least, it's supposed to be like small and cute. Right. So... Um, Momo does mean peach in, in Japanese. So she's she's like a, a small peach. She's a really cute peach. Um, peach by Adamo. Yeah, right. Um, uh, so And she is also a character in the manga as well. She's Chibiusa's friend in the manga. Um, in this episode, she wears a, a red chipao. Um, and in the manga, Momo's family ran. And she has the... Um, the ox horn um, hairstyle with the little bun um, on the top of her head. Nijato. Is that the <laughs> is that the the oxbow name? That is the name of okay. the ox horn style. Ox horn style it means literally horn head in Chinese. Well, there we go. We got horn head the, now. Their to version go of the Odongo. Yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. I well, I think. I think the the oxhorn style probably came first, and actually, it's their version. I didn't say it's their. I I know. <laughs> rip off of. No, okay, okay, fair enough. Um, uh, I've read something that Nako Takuchi actually used to wear her hair in the Odango style, and that's kind of you're rolling your eyes. Um, one <laughs> reason why she incorporated that into Sailor Moon's reason hair. Why she was home on Friday nights. Don't I Drawing think that Sailor is Moons. a misconception? <laughs> I do. I really do. Um, anyways, uh, she had friends. Um, uh, so in the manga, Momo's family ran and operated a Chinese restaurant. So going off of these clues, one can assume that Momo has Chinese heritage. So um, to honor Momo and her relationship with Shibuya, I thought that we would take a look at Chinese-Japanese relations throughout history. In the future. Yeah. Chinese future Japanese person relations. Oh, boy. Crystal person. <laughs> no, I, I take your meaning. Yeah. Um, and I guess I do want... To, I, I really want this to be a, a, as light as possible, but I do want to give... Oh, are a, you saying that they're not good? Well, I want to give a brief trigger warning that I will be talking about war, and um, there will be at least one mention of rape. Um, so this will be abbreviated, of course, because China and Japan have a very long, complicated history with each other. So I'm going to just kind of try to pick out a couple of things that I, I feel like have colored their relationship overall, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so the the first mention of Japan was in the Chinese historic text, uh, Book of Later Han, in the year 57 AD. So that's how far back this goes. Uh, in which it was noted that the emperor of the Han dynasty gave a golden seal to Wa, which is the... <laughs> <laughs> which is that, the right. wow which seal. is the <laughs> oldest yeah not that kind of seal <laughs> like uh which is the oldest name of the islands of japan in foreign writing wa wa uh -huh. and it was frequently uh so wa was frequently written in chinese and korean text with the chinese character that is translated as so this is remember the different kanji can be um pronounced the same way but they have different meanings right so this particular character pronounced wa meant uh quote submissive distant dwarf huh. uh and huh. until the the eighth century when the japanese replaced the character so they're like mm, we don't we don't really like that meaning um also pronounced wa uh that is translated as harmony peace balance oh okay so i mean <laughs> much more positive yeah it's always nice like <laughs> no it's but fast it, it, it means a respected person uh-huh not right. butt face yeah yeah right 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 <laughs> it's like maybe we could choose our name that you are referring to us as <laughs> that'd be cool um so but i i mean i think it's important that it, that doesn't mean that that's when 
Japan's history started. Right. You know, right. like there were people in Japan most likely before that. And I think we've talked maybe a little bit, but and during the uh, Jomon period, they're largely farmers. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, we'll get to this later, but before Japan met China, they, and actually several hundred years into their relationship, they didn't have, they did not have a writing system and they developed their, because, you know, Japanese writing, the kanji is, is taken from Chinese writing. They derived their, their writing system from them. Mm. Uh, but anyways, this, uh, seal that was mentioned in, uh, the, the, the book of later Han is that the king of Na gold seal was discovered in northern Kyushu in the 18th century. Uh, and doing, during the Sui dynasty, which was uh, 581 to 618, and Tang dynasty, which was 618 to 690. Then there is a pause because I guess there is another dynasty and then Tang dynasty again from 705 to 907. I, yes. Yeah. Return of the Tang. Yeah, right. Japan sent many students on a limited number of imperial embassies to China. I think we've mentioned these a little bit before. Um, these ja Japanese emissaries brought many things from, from China back with them, including uh, Buddhist teachings, a, a writing system, culture, architecture, philosophy, law, and city planning, et cetera, et cetera, And those little uh, finger cuff things. Yeah, <laughs> right. And fireworks, probably, too. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, fireworks. <laughs> uh, in fact, Kyoto was planned according to Feng Shui, uh, elements from the Chinese capital of uh, Chang'an. Um, so during the Heian period, Buddhism became one of the major religions alongside Shinto. And, of course, we've talked about Buddhism a little bit, that it is involved into so many different areas within Japanese culture. Yeah, yeah. Not only are we going to talk about China and Japan, we have to uh, talk about Korea a little bit too because they were in the mix. Okay. Um, the kingdom of uh, Pek J, um, I heard a Korean pronounce it and he, they said it. it's with a P sound even though it has a B. So, you know, languages. Okay. Um, which was one of the, the three, three kingdoms that makes up uh, modern-day Korea. So at this point in time, there were three different kingdoms in what is now modern-day Korea. Uh, toward, and, and three surnames. Yeah, right. Well, uh, and uh, Pek Jae was towards the southwest of, uh, of basically what is now southern Korea. Uh, and, and so Pek Jae and Japan were very close allies, and Pek Jae frequently helped facilitate trades between China and Japan. And sometimes uh, these cultural elements actually came to Japan through uh, Pek Jae and not China it's, uh, itself. Mm -hmm. So a very important relationship. But uh, in 663, that all changed after the Battle of Pek Gang that took place, which was the first China-Japanese conflict in recorded history. Hmm. So up to this point, I think what I've gathered is they kind of had a, a relationship where Japan was learning a lot from China. They're, you know, you know very respectful and, um, you know, uh, things were going well. Sure. And, and then this is the, the first time that they things were not going so great. Mm -hmm. But uh, this battle was part of the ancient rela relationship between the, the three Korean kingdoms. Uh, the Japanese uh, Yamato, this is the, the period of Japanese history when the imperial court ruled from modern-day Nara Prefecture, uh, which was then known as Yamato Province, um, and also the Chinese dynasties. Or Yamato Province. Well, let's call the whole thing off. Oh, okay. I see what you did there. That, that took me a second. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, yeah, the, the background of the battle involves Shilla, one of the other Korean kingdoms, trying to dominate the Korean peninsula by making an alliance with the Tang Dynasty, who were trying to defeat uh, Goguryeo, which was... The, the third kingdom, uh, which was an ongoing conflict that, that dated back to the Sui dynasty. And at the time, uh, Goguryeo was allied to Pekje. That's a lot. 
Um, so the battle itself was a horrible defeat for the Yamato forces or the forces of Japan. About 300 Yamato vessels were destroyed by a combined Shilla Tang fleet of about half the number of those ships. So the aid that, uh, to Pekje from Yamato could not help on land because they were defeated at sea. Thanks guys. Yep. Uh, and Pekje fell shortly thereafter by the end of the same year year that the battles took place okay. so that was pretty devastating took a vacation to korea <laughs> have some laughs <laughs> yeah i know right um and once peck J was defeated both shilla and tang focused on the more difficult opponent of go go ryo and go fell in 668 ad so only a couple years later and for the most part shilla uh, because they were rivals with Pekje, who were allies with Yamato Japan, they, you know, Japan was like kind of like afraid of them and were like, oh, they, they were kind of hostile towards Yamato. So they were like, <laughs> oh, crap. So due to the scale of the s- severity of their defeat, the Yamato court feared an invasion from either or both Tang or Shilla. So in response, they built a huge network of shore fortifications, so like these shore fortresses and walls and stuff like that, sure. um, throughout the rest of the 600s. And in 664, the Yamato court established frontier guards and signal fires in Tsushima Island, Iki Island, and northern Kyushu. Unaware of the outbreak of the, the Shilla Tang War, which was 670 to 676, the Japanese would continue to build fortifications until 701. Uh, and basically, they're worried that they're going to come after them, but these guys are so busy fighting between themselves that they're not <laughs> worried about Japan like at all. They're not right. even thinking about them. Right. Uh, so after 663, with the, the fall of, of Peck J., uh, Japan had no choice but to directly trade with the Chinese dynasties, which kind of intimidated them. Hmm. Uh, at first, the Japanese had little long-range seafaring ex- expertise of, of their own, but eventually, and some, I guess, historians have suggested, uh, with the aid of uh, uh, Peck J expatriates who fled the country when it fell, Uh, The Japanese improved their naval prowess as well as the construction of their ships. And this just kind of made me think, like, maybe this is one reason why them trying to help with the battle at sea with Peck J before it didn't go so well because they weren't so, was not really a good thing for them. It's not quite the same thing, but it's kind of like if the American Indians got in their canoes and rowed over to Europe to be like, hey, I was going to help out with this... uh, (laughs) With this uh, the Frankish War thing. I... Oh, man, we got our asses kicked. We want to go home. <laughs> and then later, like, the Franks are like, oh, let's give you some more, give you some ships and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like, they were, the Japanese are, like, relatively isolated. Yes. And, they're just and that's kinda, something we have to keep in mind They're not all this. really sharing in on all the, you know, the wonders of the continent and the Chinese dynasties and stuff like that. But then they're like, hey, what's going on? Let's get, let's get involved in this thing. I know. Oh, wow, that was a bad idea. <laughs> I'm getting the crap out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Build, build short forts. I know. Build a lot of short forts. I know. And then it's like, oh, maybe we should get better at the seafaring thing. I mean, I think we, something else we have to keep in mind, too, is that it was a really treacherous journey at that time. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you, you know, yeah, you can get to China by sailing past well, Korea. Well, ask, ask, ask the Mongols. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I know. With the two different tsunamis, the, um, uh, the kamikaze, mm-hmm. the... Um, why is my brain not working? The um, what what is it, it? Divine winds. Yes. Wow, getting old, everybody. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just uh, you, you could get to China um by sailing past Korea, but if you sail to Korea, that's a lot shorter of a trip. Yeah. And it's so therefore less treacherous because you're not going as far. The next point of interest is uh. Toyotomi Hideyoshi was one of the three great unifiers of Japan during the late Sengoku period, which was 1467 to 1615, which is also kind of known as like the Warring States period. This was a really, yeah, yeah, a tumultuous time uh, during Japan, even though uh, Hideyoshi did a lot to kind of unify the country, not necessarily positive, but anyways... 
Hideyoshi became the de facto leader of Japan and acquired the prestigious positions of Chancellor of the Realm and Imperial Regent by the mid 1580s. Oh, nice for you. Yeah, I know. Um, after subduing the Mori and Shimazu clans, Hideyoshi had the dream of eventually conquering China, but needed to cross through Korea first. Yeah, problem. When Hideyoshi received refusals to his demands by Korea to cross the country to Ming Dynasty China, he invaded Korea. Uh, in the first year of the invasion in 1592, the Japanese reached as far as uh, Manchuria under Kato Kiyomasa and fought the Jianzu Jurgens. Seonjo, who was a Korean king, requested aid from the Ming Dynasty, but since Japanese advances were so fast, only small Ming forces were initially committed. Uh, Konishi Yukinaga, who garrisoned the Pyongyang in winter 1592, first encountered and defeated a force of 5,000 Chinese soldiers. Wow. In 1593... <laughs> by himself. Well, not by himself. That does sound like he did it all by himself. <laughs> so they get a he, he's a warriors. scion. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, in 1593, greater Chinese participation under General uh, Li Rusong and an army of 45,000 took Pyongyang uh, with artillery and drove the Japanese to the south. But the Japanese forces defeated them at the, at the Battle of Byoke Jewan. Um, after 1593, there was a truce for about four years. Um, during that time, Ming granted Hideyoshi the title of, quote, King of Japan as part of a with withdrawal conditions but Hideyoshi felt it insulted the emperor of Japan yeah, I would think so yeah and demanded concessions including the daughter of the uh, Wanli emperor <laughs> further relations soured and war re reignited right. the second invasion was far less successful for Hideyoshi the Chinese and Koreans were much more prepared and quickly confined the besieged uh, and besieged the Japanese in the south until they were finally driven to the sea and defeated by the Korean admiral Yi Sun Shin. Hmm. The invasion was a failure, but severely damaged the Korean. But they had fun. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, that's a fun way of putting it. The, uh, but they severely damaged the Korean cities, culture, and countryside with huge civilian casualties. Um, the Japanese massacred civilians in captured Korean cities. <sighs> the invasion also drained Ming China's treasury and left it weeks against the Ma Manchus, who eventually destroyed the Ming Dynasty and created uh, the Qing Dynasty in 1644. Mm -hmm. All this I would know if I had had to take Far East history in high school. I know. I feel like I don't know... I didn't know a lot of this information and I think it's fascinating because I think it, it kind of, and there's more that I'm not talking about. Sure. Let me emphasize that because like I said, this is hundreds and hundreds of years of history. Sure. But these are just a few things that I feel like have shaped their relationships overall. Like these are like Japan's like, hmm, China looks pretty good. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, look, their first conflict, they were really injured and they were scared and they were, you know, they they, they, they were like, okay, we're going to refortify our, our shores and all that. But I think that by and large, when you look at the rest of their history, whenever somebody has attacked somebody else, it's Japan has been the aggressor. Yeah. Which I think is kind of interesting. Um in 1926, at the beginning of the Showa period, so I'm jumping ahead quite a bit, um, the Japanese wanted to occupy Manchuria for its resources. Uh, due to the fractitious nature of China at the time, the Japanese were able to gain influence in the region through espionage, diplomacy, and use of force. Mm -hmm. In 1928, the Japanese assassinated uh, Zhang Zulu, the Chinese warlord who controlled Manchuria. And the Japanese army in 1931 staged the Mukden incident, using it as a justification for the full-scale invasion of Manchuria and establishment of a puppet state, Manchuko. And I think mm -hmm. we've talked about this just briefly before. Yeah. Between 1931 and the beginning of the, the Second Sino-Japanese War in 1937, 
There were intermittent clashes and engagements between Japanese and the various Chinese forces. These engagements were collectively described by the Japanese government as, quote, incidents to downplay, to downplay existing tension. Yeah. This was primarily to prevent the United States from deeming the conflict an actual war and then placing an embargo upon Japan. This is something that Japan does a lot. I think is they they try to use semantics to do like, um, oh, no, I wasn't doing this. I was doing that. And I should say this is something the Japanese government does a lot. Right. And like and like authorities and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, The incidents collectively place pressure on China to sign various agreements to Japan's behalf. And then um, things got worse. In July 1937, the conflict escalated after a significant skirmish with Chinese forces at the Marco Polo Bridge. This marked the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War. Chinese nationalist forces retaliated by attacking Shanghai. The Battle of Shanghai lasted for several months, concluding with a Chinese defeat on November 26, 1937. Following this battle, Japanese advances continued to the south and west. A continuous aspect of these Japanese campaigns are the war crimes committed against Chinese people. The most infamous example, of course, uh, was the Nanjing Massacre, where Japanese forces subjected the population of Nanjing to looting, mass rape, massacres, and other crimes. An estimated 40,000 to over 300,000 Chinese were killed in this massacre. And I should mention that this was over a period of six weeks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Since most Japanese military records on the killings were kept secret or destroyed shortly after the surrender of Japan in 1945, towards the end of the war, World War II, um, historians have been unable to accurately estimate the death toll of the massacre. In 1946, the International Military Tribunal for the Far East in Tokyo, so this is, I guess, from a Japanese uh, perspective, estimated that over 200,000 Chinese were killed in the massacre. China's official estimate is, quote, more than 300,000, end quote, dead, based on the evaluation of China's own Nanjing War Crimes Tribunal in 1947. The actual death toll has been a topic of contention between the two countries for years. Yeah. Um, In Japan, public opinion of the massacre varies, but few deny outright that the event occurred. A small but vocal minority in the Japanese government and society have argued that the death toll was uh, was military in nature and that no such crimes ever occurred. So in other words, there were no civilian deaths. (laughs) Uh, Yep. Uh, Denial of the massacre and revisionist accounts of the killings have become a staple of Japanese nationalism. Historical uh, negationists go as far as claiming the massacre was fabricated for propaganda purposes. Right. Many Chinese, and I should say that they have talked to uh, Japanese uh, people who were in the military back then, and they have they were like, "Oh no, it happened." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it it definitely happened. Um, many Chinese people still have strong sen- a strong sense of mistrust and animosity toward Japan that originates from the memory of Japanese war crimes, uh, such as the Nanjing massacre. Um, This sense of mistrust is strengthened by the belief that Japan is unwilling to admit and apologize for the atrocities. And I should mention that, um, gosh, it was not that long ago, but one of the prime ministers, like, did, like, officially apologize, but it kind of was downplayed in China, and somebody was like, they should do it in writing, Uh, and, and I don't... You know, I, I, I get where both sides are, are coming from, and I think China just, they don't believe the sincerity of the apology. Yeah. According to a 2014 BBC World Service poll, 3% of Japanese people view China's influence positively, with 73% expressing a negative view, hmm. the most negative perception of China in the world, apparently, huh. while... Huh. Yeah, while 5% of Chinese people view Japanese influence positively, with 90% expressing a negative view, the most negative perception of Japan in the world. 
So, I mean, but additionally, it's just like the, the the Bears and the Packers fans. Yeah, I just can't get over it. I know. <laughs> I mean, I think we need uh, this came up in the videos, too. But like the, the media in both countries makes the other country look bad. Well, yeah, <laughs> I think that that is a lot of it. And I think that's a lot of the, the public perception and why it is, you know, it's it's not so great. And I did w- just want to mention this just because I think I was just kind of blown away by this. But um, China has many anti-Japan or anti-Japanese war dramas, which, although frequently ridiculous, there is one where an injured Chinese soldier throws a hand grenade into the sky, which destroys a Japanese fighter plane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then there's another one where, like, a, a kung fu master, like, rips a, a Japanese soldier in half with his bare hands. And it's it's clearly, like, <laughs> the, a dummy. And then throws the halves at two planes that blow up. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so even though this is kind of ridiculous and all that stuff, like, it doesn't really help. No. You know, and and I mean, just running up, you shared something with me, which just kind of emphasized this is still an issue. Like right now, the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo um, are happening and they've kind of heated up this rivalry. Um, yeah. Japan's table uh, top tennis pair, uh, Jun Mizutani and, and Mima Ito beat Japan's uh, Junju and Shi Wen Lu uh, in the mixed doubles. Um, it's the first time since 2004 that China did not win the gold medal at this sport in the Olympics. They did not take this well. Um, so they hit a ping pong ball on a plane and it exploded. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, uh, we, Weibo, China's equivalent to Twitter, lit up with angry responses saying the referee gave, quote, unfair rulings and calling the Japanese Olympians, quote, Little Devils and, quote, Dwarf Pirates. Nice. Um, Daily Beast has... Which goes back to the... Yes. <laughs> the, the original the name. Law. Yeah, it was Dwarf. <laughs> and I didn't even mention this, but something in it, that I came across is uh, Japanese Pirates. Real problem for a while there. Not <laughs> hey, just, they got these ships now. <laughs> I know. Not just for, for China, but for Japan in general, too. Like, nobody was happy about these Japanese pirates, oh, the like, worst. coming in and, yeah. So <laughs> okay, these guys ships. Yeah. Dwarf pirates. I'm just like, wow, that really, that just, that just gets in there, you know? Uh, <laughs> oh, so... <laughs> So salty. So yeah, the the Daily Beast has an article about it, and it's just the saltiest thing. I I I'm just like wow. And like somebody on there was like, when will the uh, these islands sink? I was like, oh, oh my oh, god. Oh, oh. <laughs> Meanwhile, Taiwan is like, keep that away from us. <laughs> yes, I I did want to do a very brief language spotlight. Um, the the Japanese term for best friend is Shinyu. Hmm. Um, and they they do um, use that when they're talking about uh, Momo-chan and Shibuyusa. Oh, okay. um, and the term for, for friend is uh, Tomodachi, which can also be used for, um, you know, more than one friend. So you can, it's very casual, but you can call your friend who you're really close with, you can call them Tomo. Like, you know, the Japanese love shortening words um and you could also i i mean it it more or less means this so tomo is like friend but if you want it to be pal buddy bro you can take the second half of tomodachi Whoa. and be like dachi oh that's my dachi that's but, my dachi <laughs> uh but that's like uh, sometimes that's like what's in anime and manga and i don't know how frequently people actually use it well you yeah. know what i mean um so there's that Itadakimasu with Usagi. What did Usagi eat in this episode? Well, Ami has something for Chibiusa, which is probably some food, maybe some donuts. We don't know. We <laughs> but we never get to find out what it is. Um, it does. It's definitely a food container. I, I just. It's maybe it's like a sweet. I mean, I just have no idea um, yeah, what it could be. Come on, show. We got a segment show on this us. to fill. I know. <laughs> it's a. Uh, it looks like a takeout container. It so does. Maybe she brought her the rest of her club. But sandwich here, or something. here's the thing, though. They don't do, um, like, like when you go to a restaurant in Japan. They don't have doggy bags. They don't have doggy bags. I'll never forget one of my friends when I was studying over there. Um, her family came to visit her. And her brother, like, just this is one of the things that blew his mind. He was like, <laughs> what? What do you mean I can't take it home? <laughs> 
totally, they're, they're at a sushi buffet and he's like ordering extra plates. And he's like, all right, now I'm going to wrap this up. Yeah, right. What? what? <laughs> There's no takeout containers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Villain Gage re-rated Batty one to five dark stars, five being the most wicked. The droids in this episode are named Chiral and Akiral or Kiraru and uh, Akiaru in Japanese. Uh, they are also known as the Bule Brothers. We'll get to that in a second. Please. Um, some sources identify Chiral and Achiral as droids. However, Chiral and Achiral are different from the droids that we've previously seen. Um, with the so I think you can make an argument that maybe they aren't. Uh, with the upside down black crescent moon on their foreheads, they're more c- closely resemble the the Black Moon Clan, and you talked about that previously. Right. Um, they also die differently than the previous droids have instead of crumbling into particles they explode um also the previous droids have been female and attacked on their own while chiral and a chiral are male and attack together well that explains a lot then because yeah maybe they're not droids i'm kind of thinking they're not they have but they have gems but they're not attached to their bodies like they're a necklace that has a gem on it yeah, you know, so maybe they're like subservient in some ways. And we to don't, their... I don't, we don't get the scene where the, you know, the gem powers down or, or whatever, right? No. But yeah. So, Mm-mm. huh? Well, then it's why it's a little different. The, why give them the gems then? I think it's confusing, but a lot of sources will be like, yeah, these are the droids for this episode. Yeah. So, um, I think there's well, a we want to come out and say that we don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. I exactly. Say definitively, I have no idea. <laughs> I am not calling. I do it. not know what this is. <laughs> Um, so for their name, I mean, we've basically covered it, but, um, chiral is a scientific word referring to an item that cannot be overlaid or superimposed on its mere image. Yeah. Uh, an object which is non-chiral is called achiral. So also the twins are known as the Boule brothers collectively. A Boule is a single crystal ingot produced by synthetic means. Sure. Yes. Okay. Look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> I mean, it's also the name of um, some bread. It's spelled the same way. Bully, some bread. bread. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and some other things. Um, I found something that I was like, oh, I don't know how I feel about that. But apparently it can be a slang term for, for butt. So I don't know how I feel about that. Where? I don't. No, I was just like boule meaning, and there, and I found uh, it might have been like some street slang. I don't know. I've heard a lot of interesting things here, but are you sure it's not bool? I think you're right because bool is is French for a bread, like a like a round bread. Because yep. bool like means ball. Yeah, I thought you were like boule, like boule boule. I apologize. <laughs> I was looking up how to. <laughs> Oh my gosh! I I try to look up words to see how they're pronounced, and I I didn't think the about internet it. will literally pronounce them for you. I right, know, but in fandom, maybe they're called they're called Boule Brothers. I that definitely sounds better than the Bull Brothers. Yeah, maybe we'll just call them the Boule Brothers. Um, <laughs> but yeah, anyways, <laughs> Boule Boule. <laughs> I, I like that. Let, let's let's go with that. Um, have we talked about on the show before how Naka Takuchi has a degree in chemistry and she became a licensed pharmacist before she was a manga? <laughs> I don't cuff? think that we have. Yeah. So I'm going to give her a pass on the uh, chirality thing. but uh, I think that she was like, hmm, chemistry. I need some bad guys. She definitely knows more than uh, than Hideo Kojima does, who is must have read a book about chemistry because the last couple of his games have been about chirality. Oh and, my goodness! Uh, they talk really? about it in uh, Metal Gear Solid, and then okay. uh, the the walking one, Death Stranding, is all about that. There's the ki- the chiral network. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, it's all about uh, interesting building bridges. So yeah, in chemistry, chi- chirality usually refers to to molecules. I think you talked about that. Like two mirror images of a chiral molecule are called uh, an antimers or optical isomers. Um, pairs of enantiomers are often designated as right or left-handed, or if they have no bias, um, a chiral. So this is the, the, the hand thing again, right. Way, you know, essentially. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I just, I think it's interesting. I, and I'm kind of wondering too, like, do you, 
Are they saying like that they're twins? Are they saying that and they're twins? Yeah. Are they are they connect? There's there's one scene where I think it's like Chiral is talking to them, and then all of a sudden a Chiral like comes out of him. Like, are are they saying they're 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 connected? Or they're the they're the you know they're they're two beings. Well, not but are they she also didn't, she connected? didn't write this. Not not this, but it, right. they are so in whatever, the manga, but they're different in the manga. So anyway, so whatever you know they were meant to be. That's that's not what they are in this. This is a this is a different idea. Fair. I think they're just you know they're just a, a, a team up. They're a duo. Okay. And they All kind right. of reflect each other. And I think, but not exactly. Okay. Because one guy has white skin and the other guy has purple skin. Yeah, Good right. dodge there. And right. then um, they have different kinds of uh, warm-up pants. They they do actually, we'll <laughs> get into the, show. I know, we'll get into the, the hair and everything too. Can we do it soon? Yeah, like right now. Yeah. I mean, so basically, um, uh, they, they have very similar looks. Um, Chiral has fair skin, red eyes, and I think he has long, light blue hair. Well, oh, Achiral has yeah, dark complexion, blue eyes, and long light purple hair. Chiral wears a bluish purple tank top, matching shoes, and light pants, where while Achiral has a white tank top, matching shoes, and blue or uh, aqua pants. Right. Um they both have the upside down black crescent moon on their foreheads, the evil dark crystal earrings and orange jewels that they wore as necklaces that have the black crescent moon on them. Um, they get some good lines in there, too. I think they're they're both pretty snarky and mean. Um, <laughs> um, and, and like basically like a chiral says, I will send you to hell. So come prepared. Um <laughs> <laughs> Which is just like okay, um, and then of course the line that you talked about with uh, Chiral, if you have time to say all that nonsense, should you not spend spend it praying to Buddha? Basically, like pro- I'm I'm about to kill you, so you should get your prayers in. Right, right. Now. which kind of like I mean, it's just a th- convention. It's a taunt. It's just a trope of the show that she gets to say all this stuff, you mm-hmm. know. And but the fact that he doesn't sit still for it. You know, I think reinforces the idea that they are not um, droids exactly. Yeah, right. Because if she they're doing something different. Because if she just started to yell something, you know, ah, the fur is murder, uh, Esmeralda, and you should, you know, and then she's like, all right, shut up, shut up. Right, 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 right. <laughs> exactly. Flat chested, nobody, shut up. <laughs> like she just, you know, break in. Like they're a little above the droids. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, so now we're up to our rating. I like how evil they are and how they work together to fight. I also enjoy how catty and confident they are. Um, maybe I'm just feeling generous today, or maybe it's because they are also in the manga, but I, I like these guys. I, I think even though it's simplistic and everything, um, they got style. I like that they're working with Esme. So I'm going to give them four out of five dark stars. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling pretty generous. Four. Yeah. Out of a possible five. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I'm giving them a four as well, although I was really close to five. Okay, yeah. Because they fit all those criteria that I, that I talk about. Uh, and they interrupt Sailor Moon. She's doing her thing. Um, they don't interrupt a man, though, when he's talking. Uh, <laughs> they do let him prattle on. Yeah. You're right. Who is this? They don't even know who this guy is. No, he throws a rose? Who right. is this? Who you're is... on top of the like the jungle gym That's equipment? Scary. You're a chatty dandy, aren't you? Yeah, right. But um, ultimately, I'm going to dock them for the unoriginal design. Yeah, it's very simple. And yeah. I mean, to be fair, that's... And basically say, how they were drawn you in don't want to get well okay i guess that's i can't fault that so i'm gonna dock now go to gucci a point here <laughs> um because we've had twin bad guys before and they've had like more interesting costumes and these guys are you know i like everything about them i just wish that they had like you know the girls have to wear you know flux stuff why do these guys show up and they're like workout clothes yeah well. <laughs> like, what are we trying to say yeah. unless they really are like evil yoga instructors right well, I like I like that idea uh, of an evil yoga instructor. I think it's entertaining, especially in the world of Sailor Moon. <laughs> You're gonna be so relaxed and uh, flexible and evil. Yeah, right. Better We're gonna be. misalign your chakras. <laughs> oh, ooh. Check this out. So four from me. Um, for Sabu or Dabu, where you talk about the most interesting differences between the sub and the dub, in the deep dub, the droids or Black Moon Clan members, a Chiral and Chiral, were renamed Doom and Gloom. Okay. Yeah. That works. Yeah. 
I mean, like... It's not exciting, but... Mean and Gene. This is Gene. I had to be mean. They they wanted it to rhyme. They needed right? two negative sounding words that, yeah. uh, you know... Uh, I can't... Mad and sad. Oh, there you go. No, I, that there doesn't you go. really no, work. It's doom and gloom. Doom and gloom. So okay. I thumbs up to that. All right. Um, I've got a couple of trivia for you for this episode as well. The other classmate of Chibiusa's, who we see at, for the first time in this anime, uh, in this episode, is named Kyusuke Sarashina. Uh, and like Momo, he appeared in the manga as well. This is the kid who decides that she's going to be Chibiusa. Sure. Yeah. The, the, the dirt, the jerk. Yeah. yeah the Kyusuke. Jerk. Um, and I should mention, so... They, they give them more color and they get more air um, air time. They get more character time in the manga. Sure. And one thing that I really like about Kyusuke when he's first introduced, he apparently is a big Sailor V fan. <laughs> okay. And he has like a Sailor V pin that he wears on his shirt. Wait a minute. We've seen this. Remember the episode where, was it Sail, was it Ami? There was a, there's a little girl, or maybe it was just Sailor Moon, the, the daycare one where there's a girl getting picked on and she's That's like. Sailor Venus. She had a Sailor Moon uh, thing on her jacket. Oh, I thought that the the boy had a was a Sailor V fan, but no, she was a Sailor Moon fan. I think they became Sailor V fans afterwards, but I can't remember if like right um, after they're saved from yeah. uh, th- from the bus crash or whatever. Right, <laughs> yeah. right, and then like something happens in the manga, and then the button on the end of that issue is like now he's got a Sailor Moon pin. So uh, okay, yeah, uh, it's cute. Right. I think it's fun. Okay, all right. uh, oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so this episode shares its name with a horror movie and apparently also an episode of Yu Gi Oh. So Child's Play. Oh yeah, Child's Play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we won't get into that again. <laughs> it's just you know. I. I, I that's what I think it's of. It's an expression. I know it's an expression. That's just where my brain goes. So I'm like, <laughs> what? I just get I see Chucky's ugly mug and I'm like, no. <laughs> so anyways, now we're up to where we rate the episode. Um I love that we get to see and meet Chibiusa's friend Mom- Momo-chan and how sweet they are with each other. Um, I-, I love how even though Chibiusa is really scared, she refuses to leave Momo alone in the state that she was in. Uh, this kid is just so brave. I-, I love it. And we get to see that apparently Chibiusa has a lot of power and it isn't just a powerful cry. Um, right. It's a little bit of a tease for the next episode, but it does get you pumped. And I do think it's, like, super plotty. Uh, But I was just, like, as I was thinking about it and thinking about all the things that I liked about it, I was like, okay. But overall, I enjoyed it. So I'm going to give it four out of five roses. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to five. Wow. Uh, You know, I think that it's, I think it's a strong episode. And, you know, plotty is not bad necessarily. Especially when it's kind of moving us out of this lacuna in the ongoing story uh-huh. um i you know chibi's uh bravery uh you know is on display yes. um most uh, you know what well, there's a great jupiter moment but yes. uh, there's a great sailing moment uh moon moment as well good bad guys um great entrance from tuxedo mask <laughs> well yeah of course <laughs> there's also like there's a lot of um creative staging uh in yeah. the animation i thought um you've got some some good cross cutting going on um, you know, yeah, good, good, uh, droid slash bad guy, mm-hmm. um, the, and an escalation of the Looney Tunes, yes! stuff, which I don't, I don't know if it's good for like the realism or the, uh, uh, the verisimilitude of the story, but you know, I appreciate it. <laughs> like cartoons do, do dumb stuff with them, you know, it's Play fine. Play with it. Yeah. Have fun. But yeah. yeah, I'm satisfied by the whole thing. I, I couldn't give it any less than five. Okay. Very good. It's a little predictable, but very satisfying. Yeah. And and I kind of like felt like at the end, you know, I felt I felt a little bit like the last couple of episodes, like I'm really like, when are they going to go to the future? Right. When are we going to get to the fireworks factory? So, um, but I'm excited that it's actually happening. Yeah. So, so my English title is Chibiusa's Friendship, Never Let You Go. Never <laughs> Let You Go. <laughs> Which I couldn't resist. Brings up a whole nother. 
written by a Japanese author. Illusion. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we'll pass that by. Okay. Uh, my dig title is it's not even a dig title, but uh, my title for this episode is Me and Momo Down by the Schoolyard. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> It's a, it's a song. 70s light rock. Yes. <laughs> or folk rock. Next episode, we are talking about episode number 82. Mirai Hei no Tabidachi, Jiku Kairo no Tatakai in Japanese. Journey to the Future, Battle in the Space Time Corridor, the English translation, and the English title, Future Shocked. Okay. Yeah. Why shocked? I don't know. You could just say future shock. Better. That's you fu- fixed it. Future shock. It well, well, that's a tease for next time. Mm. Oh. Well, you'll probably tell us what it is, but in <laughs> case you miss it, I'll tell you what that's a reference to on the next episode. Ooh, a little tease. And here's something else for next time. Uh, we don't talk about this very often, but every once in a while we do. Uh, we could use reviews. Yes, you know, if you're on please. Your, if you're on your you're on your platform of choice, and it happens to be Apple Podcasts, or it's always going to be iTunes, isn't it? Yeah. Um, leave us a review, would you? Just uh, click over there, you know, click on the five star, uh, and then just say, "Hey, it's a good job." I mean, mm-hmm. you can give it, you can rate it, and give us five stars, but it counts more, or it, it goes up on the board basically if you just say if you something write something nice, you know, or, yeah. or something that matches your review. I can. Hold a gun to your head until you give us five stars. Maybe if you think it's like three stars, just think that in your head. But anyway, uh, that that helps. And it doesn't matter what platform that you're listening to us on. I know we're on a bunch of different platforms. But yeah, I mean, if you're anywhere except listening just on the web, uh, just write a little something. Yeah. We'd appreciate it. And we'll uh, we'll call it out on the show. But yeah, appreciate that. Well, that's our show for this week. And the name of the moon will be punishing you next week with another episode of Sailor News. It's too spoopy.